All right. The sermon topic for tonight, I'm going to be preaching on the subject of fear. And the title of my sermon is, Why Are You So Fearful? We see, um, commonly we return to this passage in Revelation 21.8, when we're out soul winning or trying to explain, you know, that we're all sinners that are actually worthy of hell. You know, a lot of people think that their sin isn't really that bad. They think that, well, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a rapist. I mean, I haven't done any of these things that bad, so I don't deserve to go to hell. So we turn to Revelation 21.8 and we show them, hey, you know, here's this big list. It includes murderers, but it also says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Um, and that's usually what we focus on. But there's another part in that verse that I think is extremely important that often just gets skipped over and, and doesn't have a lot of thought given to it. And the very first few words of Revelation 28 says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murders and sorcerers and it goes on and on and on with that whole list. But the fearful, the fearful is the first thing mentioned. Being fearful is a sin. If, if you are someone who is always afraid and you have this, this fear coming over you, that is not right. That is sinful. That is not given to us by God. There is one fear that we ought to have, which is a fear of the Lord. And actually, there's, there's a little bit, you can kind of expand on that a little bit, where fear, there's certain fears and a certain reason for it. That it's, that it's not necessarily a sin, but someone who is, a, who is fearful, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're full of fear, like everything makes you afraid, all the different, you know, you're afraid of what's going to happen, you're afraid of all these different things, that is sinful. We ought not to have that type of a fear. Now, fear is a naturally occurring mechanism that we all have that's designed to keep us from doing things that are going to harm us, right? So a good example of this would be you know, when you're, if you're up on top of like the roof of a skyscraper and you're going to be a little bit fearful to get all the way right up to the edge, you go to the Grand Canyon, right? You, you, it's not sinful <laughs> to have a little bit of fear of standing right over the edge and looking down. The reason why that fear is, is instilled, I mean, it's given to us so that we don't do really stupid things like that that are going to cause us to die, right? It's going to cause us to, to foolishly lose our life. There are certain fears like that, that that's, not, um, that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about the sin of being fearful. Um, you know, those things make sense. The intention of fear is to inhibit your actions. That is what fear is supposed to do. That's, that's what it does. It, it stops you. It inhibits you from doing things. The problem is when we allow fear to inhibit us from doing things that God wants us to do. So if God has, has a way that we're supposed to live our life, God has, has things that, that's designed for you to do, that he wants you to do, he commands you to do, but then when you let fear come in and take over and you end up not doing those things because you're afraid, that is where the sin, where the sin sets in. Now, I have many different fears that can impact us and biblical examples of these fears. And I want to kind of approach them individually because you may be struggling in one area and not in another. And I want to kind of make sure that we're covering all these various types of fears that you may come across that we ought not to have. We started off here in Mark chapter number four. And I'm going to be looking, we're going to be focusing in on the latter part of this chapter when the disciples are in a ship, they're in a boat. Now, try to put yourself in that situation where you're out at sea and you're out at one of these boats. Now, this isn't like if you've only been in a boat in like Arizona, it's nothing like that what we're talking about here. Okay, we have like ponds here. <laughs> we, have, we have little tiny puddles that like you could swim across and, and you know what I mean? And there's a few lakes that are a little bit bigger, okay, I granted. But these are not the seas, typically, that we're reading about in the Bible. Where you go out into these boats, you have these, you have these real big storms, these tempests, where you have these huge waves coming in. And in this example, what's happening is that the waves are so big and the, and the ship's being tossed so much, the waves are literally coming over the boat and like into the boat and kind of filling the boat up with water. That's what's happening here. So this is not um, some real trivial thing or some light thing or just, oh, there's not a boat, like you have no reason to be afraid. There is a lot of reason for them to be fearful in a situation like that. If you put yourself in that situation, you could only imagine, I could definitely see why they would be fearful, okay? 
it's not right, and we'll see that in a minute, but, but you can understand why when you put yourself in that position. Let's look at verse number 37. The Bible reads, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, not just on the ship, but into the ship, so that it was now full. The ship is full of water from the waves beating into the ship. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, talking about Jesus, you got, you, got, you got this great storm, the waves are blowing in, and there's Jesus asleep on a pillow. <laughs> so he's, he's just taking a nap, you know, to get some rest. Not a big deal. He doesn't care about it at all. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They're like, don't you even care? We're about to die here in the middle of this storm. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So they, they come to him. They're all scared. They're worried. They're fearful. And he takes care of the problem for them. He says, okay, peace. peace. You know, imagine that, just being in the boat with them when, when you're in the middle of this huge storm, and then it just stops because Jesus said so. Just done. That's amazing. And, and, and that's why the, the reaction, look at verse number 40. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceeding. I mean, this was like, now they're even fearing even more because Jesus has power over the wind and the rain and the storm. It says, and they said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Witnessing the true power of God among them. That makes them fear even more. Now, having a healthy fear of the Lord, actually, that is a good thing. So when you read through the Bible, you're going to see, you know, we saw in Revelation 21.8, you know, the fearful is, is, is a sin. We're going to see here, Jesus rebukes them. He says, why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Oftentimes, what we're going to see is that the problem with being fearful is a lack of faith. Faith is, is something you believe in, but you can't see. It's, it's, you're, you're, you're believing in, in kind of, a, it's not an unknown, but it's, it's unseen, right? And the reason why in this situation, I think especially Jesus can rebuke them and they shouldn't have been fearful is because Jesus was right there with them, okay? There are times in your life when you could get in a situation where if you're not, if Jesus isn't with you, you have a lot more reason to fear. But if you are living the righteous life, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, if you're following and obeying God's commandments, I'll tell you right now, you have nothing to fear. You have zero reason to fear when these events, these, these external events, these life events that happen. Now look, you may never get into a boat and say, well, that's not going to happen to me. Well, let's look at this a little bit more symbolically. I mean, when you find yourself in life in the middle of a big tempest and a big storm, you've got turmoil, you've got chaos, you've got all kinds of things going on in your life around you that ends up making you real fearful. Maybe you've got some, some big medical storm. Maybe you've got some big family storm going on and it's scary and it's beating you down. If you're with Jesus, or if Jesus is with you, you have no reason to fear. Now you go to Jesus and ask him, say, hey God, help me out here. I'm in the middle of this great storm and, and you know, this is stressing me out. <laughs> help me out. And Jesus has the power to make the storm go away. He absolutely does. But we need to have that faith and know with him, know that if he's here with me, we have no reason to fear Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 5, just, just one page over. We're going to look at verse number 35. These are some life events now that we're going to be looking at here, just a few examples of life events that can happen that can be fearful. Being on this boat and having this great storm, that, is a fear, that could be a fearful thing, but we need to be able to overcome that fear and not have our mind um, being fretting out and worried about these when Jesus is with us. Look at verse number 35 of Mark chapter 5. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? We read this this morning. Remember, it's about Jesus healing. Verse number 36, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. So he tells them flat out, you know, because he just, I mean, think about that. Hearing news, your daughter's dead. Horrible news to receive. But he's with Jesus. Your daughter's dead. Don't even, don't, even bother, you know saying, don't even bother going to Jesus. Your daughter's already dead. And Jesus says, he speaks unto him personally, 
Don't be afraid, but believe. You have to have that faith. Again, the faith is what's going to be required in order to, to help you through and to overcome your fear. Because again, you know, one of the goals of this sermon is I want you to learn how to be able to overcome fears when you have major problems in your life that can, that can start to paralyze you with fear. And not to know what to do because I'm so fearful. We need to more than ever be able to rely on our faith and know that, hey, if Jesus is with me, I'm going to get through this. I, I don't have to. Because what happens is when, when people start to make decisions based on emotion, you're going to make the wrong decision every single time. When, especially when things like fear are involved. When people start making these, these fearful decisions, almost always you're going to be making a, a snap judgment. And this is why, you know, I mean, you could be prepared for so many things. But when you get in a situation outside of, of your comfort zone and you get you could be thrown into a situation where you don't know what's going on and things are turned upside down. We need to learn not to be afraid but to trust and, and to keep our faith in Christ that he can lead us through those difficult times. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 14. That's a very difficult life event to happen. That could be very scary, losing a child. I don't even want to think about what that must be like or feel like. But that man did, and, and he was with Jesus, and, and everything ended up turning out well because of his faith. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 27. Bible reads, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. This is when Jesus was walking by the boat in the middle of the night, and they thought he was a spirit, just like, they started getting freaked out already, like, what is going on out there? And, and he said, oh, don't worry, it's just, it's just me, right? It's, it's Jesus. And Peter's like, okay, if it's really you, then... then Call me out to you, right? So he does. He says, and he said, come, verse 29. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. What an incredible event. Mm -hmm. You hear about Jesus walking on water, you say, well, yeah, he's the son of God, right? I mean, it's just another miracle that's blowing our minds because he's walking in the middle on water in the middle of the lake. Peter got to participate in that. What a cool experience to just be able to say, Wow, I got out of the boat. Now I'm walking on water. Why? Because he was trusting in Christ. He says, well, if you call me out to you, I'll come out to you. Just, just call me. I'm there. I'm ready to do it. I trust that you're not going to tell me to do anything that's going to harm me and, and, just, you know, and kill me. And, and, and you know, I trust what you're doing. If you tell me to come out there, Jesus, I've got faith in you that, that I'll be just fine. And he was. But look what happens. Verse number 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? See, it's a lot easier in our life to have the faith that we need when things are going really well. When we don't have the problems, when, when the waves don't rise up and, and cause us to be afraid. If, he's, if, if the water was all just completely calm, he probably would have made it all the way out to Jesus without a problem. Because it was calm. There was nothing going on at that time to disturb him and, and to cause him to fear. But as soon as that wave came, I mean, imagine he's walking. Imagine you walking on a wet water. You're still kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? And then there's this big wave comes up. used to being in your fleshly mind normally in normal conditions first of all you're not going to be walking on water so you see this big wave and it scares you you think oh man this thing's going to knock me over and, and i'm going to drown because there's a big wave here but you're already walking on water right it, it, there's already a miracle going on you don't need to worry about that wave jesus is right there he's called you out to him you're doing what he bid you to do this is why we don't need to be afraid. And that's why he said, you know, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? But we also notice here too is that Jesus Christ, as soon as he called out for help, it says, there's that word again, immediately. 
I love that about Jesus Christ. Is that like, you know, people are asking to be healed. Immediately they get healed. G Peter's out here. As soon as he begins to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand. He's like, okay, gotcha. Not going to let you sink. When you're with Jesus, you have nothing to fear. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 10. You're in Matthew 14. Just go back a little bit to Matthew chapter 10. There's another fear, other fears that we may face in our life. First fear we face is, is just general things that might happen, life circumstances, deaths, uh, you know, fear of losing jobs or fear, you know, other fears that could kind of external forces come upon you that are unforeseen. The big wave that came up, he wasn't really thinking about a big wave coming up. It just, it was all of a sudden it was right there. And that made him afraid. That made him fear. Instead of being uh, comfortable just knowing that he's with Jesus and not worrying about the outside influences. Another thing that we need to work, that we need to make sure that we are um, settled in and, and don't allow to, to influence us is a fear of persecution. Being persecuted for your beliefs. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 16. The Bible reads, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, right off the bat, you're thinking, I know what wolves do to sheep. <laughs> Isn't that a pretty good reason to be afraid if I am a sheep and there's wolves out there? Normally, yeah. Physically, sure. But when Jesus is telling you to do it and you're obeying him, there's absolutely no reason to fear it. He's letting you know right off the bat, though, what to expect. Hey, I'm sending you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is the way the world is. When you're a believer, when you're a disciple, when you're a follower of me, you're going to be going out there and there's a lot of wolves out there. And you need to be aware of this. So being aware of something is going to help to strengthen you during the difficult times. But don't let that awareness turn into fear. Because what you could do is you could see something like this and say, man, I don't want to have anything to do with wolves. And then you just stop following. So well, I'm just not going to follow Jesus then because I don't want to be sent out as, as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's sinful. That's, the, that's what we want to prevent. What we ought to be able to do is recognize that, say, okay, well, I'm going to be prepared. Now I know I'm like a sheep going out in the midst of wolves. I'm going to be ready for this. But I'm not going to fear because this is what Jesus has for me in my life. Verse number 17 but beware of men. Again, being wary. He's giving us a warning. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Look at this, verse 21, and it gets even worse. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. Being betrayed by your own family to be executed. That can be a very fearful circumstance to find yourself in. Right? And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and a servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? We've seen multiple things up to this point in this chapter. We see you're being sent forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. We see, hey, beware of men because they're going to whip you. They're going to scourge you. They're going to deliver you up to be executed. You're going to be hated of all men because of me, because of Jesus Christ, because of his his beliefs all of these things but look what he tells them in verse 26 fear them not therefore he I just told you all the things that they're gonna do but don't be afraid 
Don't fear them. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. We don't have enough people that are listening to the, to the commands of Jesus Christ here to not be afraid of what other people are going to think. He says, what I tell you, what you learn in the secret, what you learn at home, what you learn when I whisper in your ear, when you're reading your Bible, he says, preach that in the housetops. Don't be afraid of what anybody's going to do to you, especially in these days. Don't be afraid of the sodomites that want to ruin you and destroy you and threaten your children and come after you and destroy your business and are un implacable and unmerciful and are not going to stop until there's bloodshed. Don't be afraid of them. Amen. What I've told you what you, what, what God has said, what the Bible says, what Scripture says, that's the truth, and that needs to be proclaimed. What you've learned from here, shout it from the housetops. God didn't give us His words to be hidden, to be underground, to be, to be passed around secretly for fear of what man can do unto you, for fear of persecution to come. God doesn't want us to be afraid. He says... I've already told you you're going to be hated. I already told you they're going to try to do these things to you. What, what would have happened if Jesus feared for his life? Think about that. He had a lot of people plotting to kill him. He had a lot of people after him. And a lot of people hated what he was saying. What if Jesus would have trimmed the message? What if Jesus would have held back? Oh, well, I guess I'm stepping on their toes. Maybe I should back off a little bit. Oh, man, these people, I made them so angry. They want to kill me. I better back off a little bit. That's not the Savior I have. There wouldn't be a Savior at all. Jesus loves us enough to tell us everything and not to hold anything back from us. And he says, that's the way that we need to be. And we need to not be afraid and let them use fear against us to silence us. We need to be able to preach from the rooftops. Will you hear an ear that preach upon the, the housetops? Verse number 28, and fear not them which kill the body. He said, that's about all they could do to you. They could, they could destroy your flesh. He says, but are not able to kill a soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, don't be afraid of man. Man can only do so much to you. You be afraid of God because God has power over, over everything. I mean, God is the one who's in charge and has the authority. He's the one that's, that's capable of destroying soul and body in hell. He's like, that's where you need to be worried. If you're going to be worried about anything, if you're going to be afraid of anyone or anything, because what happens is when people get afraid of preaching God's word, what are they doing? They're elevating the fear of men above their fear of God. If God's the one saying, preach this from the housetops, and you're afraid of man and what man's going to do to you, you're saying, well, no, God, I'm not going to be afraid of you because I'm afraid of these people more. Don't let them do that. We ought to have a healthy fear of the Lord. Look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So he continues on there in verse 30 and 31, saying, look, the hairs on your head are numbered. God cares for you. Even though you're being persecuted and all these things that might be, are, are going to be coming against you when you're living right and you're, and you're preaching right and you're doing right, don't forget that God really does care about you and that your very, the very hairs on your head are numbered. He cares about you, so don't fear. God knows what you're going through. God, He's warning you. If it, it, <laughs> he wouldn't have warned you about it if He didn't care about you. He's letting you know, hey, this is going to happen. But don't, don't let it scare you. Don't be afraid of it. Be able to go through it and endure it without being afraid because your Father in Heaven is watching out for you very carefully. And God's not going to allow anything to happen unless it's going to end up being according to His will. 
if you're right with God, if you're doing right, you have nothing to fear. If, you're, if you've got Jesus with you, you've got nothing to fear. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at chapter number 11. We looked at fear of life events, things that might come up in our life that could, that could scare us, that we ought not to be afraid of. Now we're looking at the fear of facing persecution, what man can do unto us, what, what people can do for our religious beliefs, for our belief in the Bible, for our, our proclaiming the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 11 is uh, commonly referred to as a faith chapter. And we've seen in, in, in almost all of these instances when Jesus tells them not to be afraid, it's because they're lacking faith. Right? The two go hand in hand. The more faith that we can have in God's word, the less we have to be afraid. The more faith you have in what you're doing is right, the less you have to be afraid. Because let's face it, when, people, when you get attacked by all sides, by people telling you, you're hateful, you're wrong, you're do, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you think. It's, it could cause you to doubt and say, well, wait. And look, any reasonable person, if everybody around you is telling you that you're wrong, you're going to think about what you're doing. That's normal, naturally. There's nothing wrong with that because none of us are just so, we shouldn't be so lifted up in ourselves that we're all just completely, you know, everything I do is right. So when you're hearing from everyone you're wrong, you're going to think about what you're doing. But see, what we need to do is not, be, not let them scare us and instill fear in you and have that be a reason why you say, oh, well, I'm wrong because they're, they're making me afraid. You need to just say, well, what did God say? Am I doing what God told me to do? Is this, is this what the Bible says? Yes. All right. Well, then I'm fine with it because I'm going to keep my faith in God and God's word and not worry about people, you know, calling me a hater or what, whatever, whatever the, whatever the outcome may be, which that's, that's nothing compared to what Jesus was talking about. Hebrews 11, look at verse number 24. We're going to see Moses as an example. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses had a great decision to make there. He could have continued in Pharaoh's house, having all these you know, sinful pleasures and whatever else he wanted to do, if he would have just kept silent and not, and not made a big stink about you know, God's people being in bondage and, and needing to be delivered from that. But he said, nope. This is what God's called me to do. This is what God wants me to do. It's going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be a lot of people against me. Pharaoh himself is going to be against me. His whole household is going to be against me. The house that I grew up in, everybody's going to turn on me. But I'm going to do what's right. Why? Because he had faith. Because he knew that there is much greater riches than all the treasure of Egypt. He's like, I don't care how much silver and gold they have. There is way more treasure that I, could, that I can attain. It's everlasting value than what Egypt has to offer. And yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be maybe a little challenging. But he had the faith to stick with it and to do it and not to be afraid, not to be scared by what Pharaoh of Egypt was able to do unto him. Pharaoh had a lot of power in this earth. But you know what? That power is nothing compared to the power of God. Look at chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. Just go a couple of pages over. Hebrews chapter 13. A little encouragement here. Look at verse number five. The Bible reads, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We're con content with what we have. You know, Forget stupid covetousness. Be content with what you have. And he says, and, and we could just be content knowing that Jesus Christ said, hey, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. He's with us at all times. So having that faith that God said, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, we could boldly say, well, the Lord's my helper and I will not fear what man can do unto me. God's with me all the time. 
you're in Hebrews, turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's go a little bit um, not too far from there, a little forward. I'm going to read for you from Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 reads, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We are continually admonished, because look, God knows that these things can be fearful unto man. Which is why he continually tells us, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm preparing you. I'm warning you. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be persecutions that arise. Don't be afraid. Stay the course. Proverbs 29, 25 reads, the fear of man bringeth a snare. It's a trap. Don't let man make you afraid. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You're in 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 13. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Don't be afraid of their terror, he says. Um, turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter number 2. We're going to see two examples here that we ought not to be a fear. You know, that, that's a fear of persecution. We saw fears of persecution. The Bible's admonishing not to be afraid of what man could do unto you. Don't be afraid of, of how they could um, do you know, kill your body, but have no power over your soul. Don't be afraid of these things. Don't be afraid of your life events. And don't be afraid of how people are going to react to your message. That's not our job. The Bible has, has um, ordained men to give this, the, the preaching of, his, of God's word, to let people know, hey, thus saith the Lord, this is what God says. I'm the messenger, but this is what God says. That we are not to worry about how people are going to react to what God says. That's their problem, and that's God's problem. That's not our problem. But we are supposed to be faithful messengers. He actually gives Jeremiah and Ezekiel, two great preachers, used mightily of God, basically the same instructions. I'm going to read you for, for you from Jer Jeremiah chapter 1 when God is approaching Jeremiah and telling him, Hey, I've got a job for you. I want you to preach this message for me. In verse number 6 of Jeremiah 1, the Bible reads, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Jeremiah is having a conversation with God. God said, Hey, I got a message for you to send. He said, Look, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a child. I mean, I, I'm not that good at speaking. You know, I can't do this work. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. When you are preaching God's words, the words that God has for everybody, we don't need to worry about their faces faces or be afraid of how people are going to react when you preach God's word. Why? Because God's going to be with you. Now, when you start going off and just making up your own stuff and claiming it's from the Bible, that's a different story. What he's explaining to Jeremiah is saying, look, I have a message for them from me and you're going to deliver it. And if you're speaking my words unto them, you have nothing to fear because I'm with you. So I'm right here to protect you. And it makes sense. God's sending a messenger. Of course he's going to look out for him. Of course he's going to watch over him and make sure that his message is, is given to the recipients. When we are preaching God's word, all of God's word, and explaining, look, thus saith the Lord, O wicked and sinful generation, this is what the Bible says, you need to watch out, you need to be afraid, because there's a God in heaven who is angry with the wicked every day. We don't need to worry about how people are going to receive that. 
I don't need to worry. I don't, I, as a preacher, I can't be standing up here looking at everyone's face going, okay, what should I not say anything more about anymore because someone's giving me a dirty look. And if you think it hasn't happened before, think again because it's happened multiple times. And it's going to continue to happen. And you know what I do when that happens? I'm going to hit it even harder. Because it means that God's word is making an impact on somebody. And it needs to be said even louder and, and again, repeated if necessary. It happened just recently. I, I repeated an entire statement because and like, there's nobody here. Don't worry about it. It's not, it's just, we get people that come and go through this church that get, that get angry when they hear God's word. It's not my fault. I mean, I'm not, I'm not making up this stuff. And literally, literally, with the last one that I can remember specifically about the faces that I wasn't afraid of and I'm not going to be afraid of, it was literally a passage in the Bible, in the book of Psalms that we were reading that was making them really upset. It wasn't even my exposition of it. It was just, there we go. We see what the word says. Okay, that's what it says. Let's read it again. You're in Ezekiel chapter 2. We're going to see what God said to Ezekiel. It's basically the same message. <coughs> he told Jeremiah, look, I've got a message for you. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. You're going to say my words. And don't be afraid of what people, uh, their faces, what they're doing to you, what they're going to say to you. It's not your job how they receive it. It's your job just to preach the truth. Ezekiel chapter 2, look at verse number 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Again, the same warnings, the forceful warnings, saying, look, don't be afraid. He reiterates himself multiple times when he's preparing his preachers to go out and preach the truth. Don't be afraid of them, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And he's saying, if you don't preach what I'm telling you to preach, now you're going to be the one in rebellion, just like they're in rebellion for not wanting to listen and not wanting to hear. So we need to make sure that we're right with God because he's saying, look, you need to preach. They're not listening and they may not listen and they're a rebellious house, but you need to preach this nonetheless and don't make up their minds for them. You preach them the truth. And if you decide not to preach the truth when I'm telling you to go do it, now you're in rebellion. Now you need to make sure, again, who do you fear? Do you fear man and what they're going to do to you? Or are you going to fear God, what he's going to do to you for not listening and not obeying when he tells you to do something? I'll tell you what, I hope my children have more fear of what their father is going to do when I tell them to do something and they don't do it than some other random person that's not related to them tells them, hey, you better do this and if you, know, if you don't do it, there's going to be some consequences. Right. They better know that their dad's going to follow through on what they're doing and that I actually have the authority to tell them what to do whereas someone else don't have that authority. So the, the, the person who's going to stand up to Ezekiel and stand up to Jeremiah, they have no authority to tell him to shut up and to stop speak, you know, preaching the word of God and, and, to, and to scare him into not saying anything. But you know who does have authority? God does. God has the authority to tell Jeremiah and Ezekiel, hey, you better preach this. And they never need to be listening to the Lord. Look at verse number 9, Ezekiel 2, 9. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written there in lamentations and mourning and woe. That was the message that Ezekiel was given. That's not a popular message. Lamentation, mourning, and woe. Because this is the book that God's saying that, that, hey, open up your mouth, eat what I'm giving you, and that's what you're going to be preaching, right? Obviously, there's some symbolism here, but it was not positive things at all. Not things that are going to be received greatly, and they weren't. Children of Israel didn't listen very well when, when Ezekiel preached, but God wanted it to be preached anyways. Right. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, these are great examples for us, great heroes of the faith, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. Why? Because they listen to God. 
They didn't fear. They didn't worry about what other people did to him. I mean, Jeremiah was thrown into the dungeon. He was, you know, sinking in the mire, and they barely, he was barely kept alive with a little stale bread and some water, and, you know, he's basically left to die in the dungeon as a result of him preaching God's word. But he did it anyways, and he remained faithful. And you know what happened to Jeremiah? God ended up taking care of him. He was saved out of that. And then when they were finally taken captive, guess what? Jeremiah was taken, was, was taken care of. He wasn't just, just brought into captivity. He said, okay, well, you can do what you want now, Jeremiah. And that was from God, blessing him for, for the work that he had done. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. See, this is a large reason why more people do not go out and preach the gospel. It's because of their fear. It's because they're afraid of what people are going to say. They're afraid of what their friends are going to think about. Oh, that's kind of weird. What do you mean? You go out and knock on doors? They're afraid of what, what is the person at the door going to say? Are they going to come at me with a shotgun and say, get off my property? Look, that doesn't happen. Now, someone somewhere might have had that happen sometime. I'll probably get a comment on YouTube for it. But don't let that be. That's like saying, you know, the Bible says, oh, there's a lion in the way, so I'm going to stay, you know, in my house. Okay, it's foolishness. God, when God told you to do something, go do it. And you know what? If that story is around and they're preaching the right gospel, well, God took care of them. They didn't die, right? <laughs> it, was just, it was just a scary event, but it shouldn't have been scary. because. And this is why I, I'm not afraid to go into any neighborhood and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if I'm commanded to preach the gospel to every creature, I'm not going to say, well, this neighborhood isn't a very good neighborhood, so I'm just going to forsake them all to hell and not obey God when he said, go preach the gospel to every creature because I'm afraid of what man might do to me in this neighborhood. No. I've never let the people, people have criticized me for, you know, you bring your wife into these neighborhoods and you go into South Phoenix. Up. Look, yes, we do. You know why? Because God's with us, because we're doing God's work. And I'm not afraid of what man can do to me because I know that God's with us. Amen. And we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And they're just people. Anyways. I mean, they're real people. Okay, I don't care what you see on the news and the monsters they make, you know, like, you go into that neighborhood. Actually, a lot of the people in those neighborhoods are more friendly than the ones in the rich neighborhoods anyways. I get invited into the house way more often in those neighborhoods than I do in the, the fancy rich when everyone's got everything together and they've got their big houses and stuff. Those are the ones that are most likely to get run off than in the ghettos where, yeah, there's crime. Yeah, there's gangs. Yeah, there's things going on. But you would never know that if you let fear take hold of you and decide not to go and, and do what God has for you to do because you're afraid. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So he's talking about when, when Paul first came to Corinth. So when I first came among you, I didn't come with excellency of speech and wisdom, you know, and making these big orations and stuff. He says, I just came unto you with the testimony of God. He says, I didn't determine to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I just preached the gospel. Look at verse number three. And I was with you in weakness and in fear. He's acknowledging here that he had fear. He said, look, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And he's saying, I'm basically saying is that I am nobody. I didn't come to you with this great skill and with these great words and, and with this, this great, you know, man's wisdom. He says, I came to you in weakness. I came to you in fear. I came to you in trembling. But the power was from God. The power was in the gospel. The power was that he's being used by God. He said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. I didn't go there trying to convince you to, to follow me because I'm so smart and I'm so wise and I have all this great skill. He said, I wanted your faith to be in the power of God. And this is what we need to realize. If you're, if you're afraid of preaching the gospel to somebody, get over yourself. 
because it's not about you. Don't be afraid of approaching somebody to give them the gospel because it is not your power that's going to save them. It's God's power. God has commanded us and he wants to use you to preach the gospel to somebody. You stop worrying about yourself and worry about the other person that needs to hear the gospel. God will use you. You say, well, I don't know that much about that. Look, it's not your wisdom that's going to do it. Take the verses with you, write them down so that you can use God's word and let God do the power. Let God do the saving. Let God use you with his power. Go in weakness. Go in fear. Go in trembling. But go and do it. Amen. And don't let that fear paralyze you to not do it. Look, I'll be honest with you, as I believe that the Apostle Paul's being here, I was with you in weakness, I was with you in fear, I was with you in much trembling. I've been, this challenge I did for our church, the, the every day trying to preach the gospel to someone, I did it for me just as much as I did it for you, if not more so for me. Okay, I'm just being honest with you. When I, when I was thinking about this, I need this because everybody is susceptible to fear. And there's been a couple times already where I knew I had to do it and I wasn't feeling like it. And there's times where it's like, oh, that person looks kind of busy. Oh, I don't really want to bother that person. You just need to do it. No, I'm thankful. I thank God. Look, I've gone out in, in meekness and in fear, but just to do God's work. And he's blessed it. And I'm not lifting myself up. I'm just, I'm actually trying to just be real with you saying, don't worry if you have a little bit of fear, but overcome that fear by doing, with your faith, knowing that what you're doing is right. By faith, knowing that, hey, this is what God has for me to do. So if I'm a little anxious, if I'm a little bit nervous, if I'm not quite sure, if this person doesn't look like they're going to be receptive at all, just do it. And I'll tell you this much from all my experience out soul winning, the people that you think are least, gonna be, uh, least likely to listen to the gospel are usually the ones that get saved. I mean, almost hands down, so many times I've come across people like, there's no way this person's going to listen to me, but I have to do it, so I'll do it anyways. They end up just listening and receiving it and getting saved. It's just like, well, praise God. Obviously, I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm talking about because it's the power of God anyways. A person that wouldn't normally give any attention to what I have to say, when you're preaching God's words, it's God's words. It's not your own power. Don't allow fear to paralyze you. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. We need to overcome our fears. And again, what is the fear? What, what is the fear when you're trying to preach the gospel to someone? What is that fear? Why do you have that fear? It doesn't make any sense. It's not rational. What, what is the big deal? And just think about this. I'm putting myself in a situation where I'm in a gas station and there's people all around and there's people pumping gas and there's people going in and out of the store and being busy. What is the big deal? What do you have to be afraid of to just say, excuse me to any one person? Do you know for sure if you're going to heaven when you die? Say, oh, but that's awkward. That's weird. Why would you say something like that? Well, what's the big deal? What, what do you really have to be afraid of? What are they really going to do? They might look at you funny. The Bible said don't be, don't be afraid of their faces. They say, well, that's kind of weird. Why are you asking me that? Well, the reason why is because God said to preach the gospel to every creature, and that's what I'm, I'm trying my best to do. You don't have to be a slick salesman. To do it now there's techniques that could help you improve and 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 make people feel more comfortable and try to get really good results that way great use those but to to be in obedience to god and to be preaching his word you don't need any of that you just need to have faith and do it and overcome your fears because they're seriously what, what are they going to do there's nothing the fear is all internal it's all in your head it's it's a it's a fleshly thing that is not a rational fear. Like the, the rational fear is standing by the Grand Canyon not wanting to fall in. That's rational. That's reasonable. Not wanting to speak to somebody is, is not rational at all. 
Just because you don't know that person, there's no reason not to, not to approach them and talk to them. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. When you're fearful, when you feel that, it's not of God. God didn't give that to you. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Look at this, verse 8. Be not there, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. When you decide that you're afraid and you don't want to preach the gospel, do you know what that's saying? It's saying you're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of God's gospel? Are you ashamed of that, that saving gospel? If you're afraid to tell somebody about it, what are you ashamed of? God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. That's not from God. He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. We ought to be able to proclaim. It's good news. I mean, it, it, does anyone here think it's bad news that God gave you a free gift and has, has washed all of your sins away and that you're going to enjoy an eternity in heaven and that you have no worry at all about going to hell? Is it, I mean, is that bad news, anybody? Is there any reason not to share that great news with other people? Of course not. It's the best thing you could ever receive in your life. Look, I thank God more than anything else of anything that's ever happened in my life of the day that I called on Jesus and got saved. Thank God for that. That was the best day of my life. Why not want to give other people the best day of their life? Because they might say no. But they might say yes. I'll just read this for you. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 20. It's the last... Uh, I don't want to make that claim. It might be the last place I have you turn. Don't be afraid of the fight. We saw at the end of 2 Timothy 1.8, Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. 2 Corinthians 7.4 reads, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. We get from some of these accounts, the Apostle Paul is, is revealing, you know what? Sometimes there are fears. But don't ever let that get you down. God can help you with that. He says, without, we're fighting. Look, there's fighting going on all around us. We're in the midst of persecution. We have all these things coming within our fears. But don't let those fears manifest themselves into inaction. Or even come out, we need to be able to overcome those fears before they overcome us. And see, God will also help us and allow for us, as we said, within our fears, but he said, nevertheless, God comforted us. How did he do it? He sent Titus, a fellow laborer, a fellow soldier, to come and, and quench their fears and to encourage them in the Lord. We ought to be able to be a blessing to other people, especially during things like this, like this month of, of encouragement to one another to say, don't be afraid, don't fear. Hey, look, we're out there. I'm doing this work right with you. I'm making sure I'm going out and I'm preaching the gospel with you. Okay? It might not be side by side, but, but we're, I'm out there doing it too. And encourage people and to not give in to your fears. But when you're being outwardly fearful, that's going to cause others to fear. This is infectious. Fear is like an infectious disease. Look at Deuteronomy 20, verse number 1. We're going to see an example of this played out. This is talking about a battle when you go to war, when you go to fight about who you need to send home and not even be part of the battle. Because we're in a spiritual battle. It's not a physical one. We're in a spiritual one. And we need soldiers that are going to fight and not be afraid. Look at verse number one. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. 
Right off the bat, he said, you see all these weapons, they got horses, they've got chariots, and they've got way more people than you do. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't let that bother you. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Again, you need to have faith. God's with me. Verse 2, And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be terrified because of them. Here's why. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate him. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. Look at verse number 7. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in battle and another man take her. Excuse me, verse number 8. This is what I want to point out. And the officer shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. He's saying, you know what? If you're afraid of this battle, just go home right now. We don't need you. We don't want you because what's going to happen is when you start being afraid, you start telling, oh man, I can't believe other people. That's going to that's gonna infect other people and you're going to start to get them to doubt and them to, to lose their confidence and to lose their faith because you're casting all these other doubts before them. Fear is really just an illusion. And that's what Satan is a master of. He's a master of illusion. He's trying to get you to be fearful of things and throwing things out there. What if this happens? What if this person does that? And it's all these hypotheticals. What if this happens? And none of it's going to happen because God's with you. And he just wants to shake your confidence, shake your faith. And when people are fearful and you start spreading that fear to others, saying, oh man, I can't believe you do that. But you, you know, you're going to make other people afraid too. We need to overcome those fears. We need to look to those that are, that are um, pillars, that are, that are, that are good um, workers, that are, that are, that are already uh, have good testimony, not being fearful, just like God sent Titus to gain our strength from. So that when you do have those inner fears, don't just start bringing that out for everyone else to become fearful but look to someone else to gain some confidence in and say, okay, here's someone else doing the same exact thing. They're being strong. They're moving forward. I could be strengthened through their strength and move forward and do what I know is right. We need to be able to identify our fears, whatever they may be. Everybody has different things that bother them more than others. There's, there's certain things that for whatever reason, I'm afraid of this. I'm not afraid of this. Like, I'm not afraid of bugs, right? But some people are really afraid of bugs. I, spiders don't bother me. You know, I think cockroaches are gross, but like I have no problems going up to them and killing them or smacking them with my hand or whatever. It's not a big deal. But some people are really bothered by that. Okay, and that's a silly example, but there's other things that are more important in our life that, that you know, f for me, a big thing I overcame, I've mentioned this many times before, was speaking in front of a bunch of people. I hated doing that. I was fearful. It was one of my biggest fears was ever doing that. But you have to push yourself to overcome those fears when you see that this is, what, this is God's will. This is what he wants you to do. Okay, well, I guess I'll just have to get over that then. We need to, and, and you know what? Some people have no problems. Some of you here might be able to come up here without a problem and just start talking and not have any issue with it whatsoever. And that's great. But you probably have some other fear. Something else that you have to overcome. We all have our own issues, or whatever it is that we have to deal with. We need to overcome these fears and not let us show up. We identify what they are. Think about yourself and the areas. Where do I have a fear that I need to overcome? We need to pay attention when you choose not to do what you're supposed to do because of your fear. And we need to focus on overcoming that fear. My last point, and this could probably be an entire sermon in and of itself, we should be on the offensive as Christians. Usually the fear comes in when you start feeling like you're, you know, you're being attacked and everything's coming up on each side. You're going to start to feel afraid <coughs> because you're overwhelmed with everything going on around you. 
There was a time when the Christians were on the offensive and they were the ones promoting and preaching from the housetops and not afraid of anyone else and actually making the enemy be the ones that should be afraid. You know, we ought to be approaching, you know, preaching against the sodomy and the wickedness and get them back in the closet, right? Instead of them making Christians fearful and afraid to say anything anymore, oh man, what are they going to do to us? No, we need to be bold and shout from the housetops and say, we're taking it back. We're going to promote godliness and righteousness. And if you're a wicked person, get back out of here, get in the closet and hide what you're doing. You ought to be ashamed of what you're doing. There's a time when people doing sinful acts was a shame. There's a time when people who didn't cover their bodies were ashamed and wouldn't go out in public. Now you have people walking around in string bikinis and they don't blink an eye about it because they have no shame because they're living in a wicked, filthy society and the men of God didn't do their job standing up and preaching against the filth, preaching against the wickedness, but became tolerant. They're the ones that ought to be afraid, not you. You've got the truth. You've got God's word. Don't let them scare you and make you afraid of what you believe and what God's word says. We should also be able to use fear of hell for salvation. There's a one time where, where you know, I don't believe it's right. You know, there's cults that will use fear over their congregation to, to, to get them to do things. But the, the one place where fear can be useful is for someone who's unsaved to, be, to get the fear of hell and the fear of a judgment that they, that they deserve in order to, to help them to, um, to change, to repent, to get right with God by believing on Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Jude, verse 22, and of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment, garment spotted by the flesh. We save them with fear. That is, the, that is a, a legitimate use. And, and why is that? Because people ought to be afraid of the judgment. That, there's nothing wrong with having that type of a fear. The Bible says that, that um, godly sorrow worketh repentance. So like having that sorrow or having even a fear of like, like being afraid of what God's going to do to you if I do such and such a sin or whatever, that's fine. Being afraid of what God's going to do to them because of their sin, it gets, that's a, that, that would be considered a godly fear, right? And that's the fear that we could use to help people to get saved, is just to, to expose that truth to them, love them enough to show them, hey, there's a judgment, and save them with that fear. The last verse I'm going to read for you is Romans 8, verse 14. The Bible reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to, to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We should not be living a life that is, that is uh, a life of fear in any way. And if fear is, is overcoming you and paralyzing you from doing what's right, from, from fulfilling what God has given for you to do in your life that you know is right, I'm not talking about some mysterious thing that's this called the will of God that nobody knows anything about. I'm talking about things that you could read and see plainly in the Bible. The biggest one that comes to my mind that's affected by fear is preach the gospel to every creature. That seems to be the, the number one thing that people have a problem with because there's so few people out there doing it. And I think that's a big result of fear. But there's other things, a fear of, of, of standing up just on basic righteousness and righteous principles because the world might think that you're weird or peculiar or different. Well, guess what? You are. You're, you're a chosen priest of the royal generation. You're a peculiar people that God has called unto himself. He doesn't want you to be like the world. He wants to be different. He wants to be separate. He wants to be holy. Don't be afraid of people calling you weird or people thinking, oh, man, you don't watch movies. You don't watch TV. You don't do this. You don't do that. You don't smoke. You don't drink. What's the matter with you? Don't be afraid of that. Who cares? The Bible says that, you know, in, in, the, in the, the, the end of Ecclesiastes, you know, this is the, the, let us hear the conclusion of the matter, right? This is the whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. If we're fearing God properly and keeping his commandments. We don't have time to fear about what anyone else has to say or do. Let's just worry about what God has for us to do and do it without fear Find out what your fears are. Learn to overcome them. Get some strength from other people who don't have a problem with that. And, and let's all move forward as a church without fear.
Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we can receive from your words, the encouragement we can receive from other people, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be bold in our speech. Help us to, to preach your word without fear, without worry about what other people might do or think or say. God, we thank you, we thank you for all the great examples in the Bible, Lord. Increase our faith. Help us to understand that if, if God be for us, who could be against us? That you will not leave us, but you'll actually fight our battles for us when we yield up ourselves to do your will, dear Lord. We pray for your strength and encouragement tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.